welcome to the Artist Sessions. I'm Janice Cotter, the Gallery Manager at Homo Arts. Uh, this evening, before we get started, I'd like to express gratitude to the Pomo Arts Board of Directors, as well as say how thankful we are for the financial support of the Government of Canada, the Province of British Columbia, and the City of Port Moody. Over the next two Thursdays, you'll meet the recipients of the 2020 Quiam Choi Exhibition Scholarship. Established in 2007, the Quiam Choi Exhibition Scholarship is an annual award of $2,000 that recognizes two emerging BC artists. In the spirit of the late Port Moody artist Quiam Choi's experimental practice and his artistic mentorship, an endowment fund was established to, to provide support to emerging artists by covering the costs of mounting a solo exhibition at the Port Moody Art Center. As an integral component of expanding their artistic careers, the 2021 call for proposals will, for the Quiam Choi Exhibition Scholarship will be live uh, on Pomo Arts website by Tuesday, August 25th. Our artist this evening works in printmaking, video, and installation. He said that his earliest memories involved watching, acting, stagehand work, and stagehand work with his father's local theater ensemble. Informed by this early exposure to community theater, the ubiquity of graphic imagery and the rapid gentrification of his childhood neighborhood, neighborhood Sylvan Hamburger carves and prints found materials to examine the relationships between narrative, place, and meaning. Now I'd like you to meet Sylvan Hamburger, who's joining us in the gallery to talk about his exhibition, Open House Press. Hello, Sylvan. Welcome this evening. I'm going to uh, pass it to you and let you tell us all about your exhibition. Great. Thanks, Janice. Um, thanks for thanks for tuning in, folks. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded uh, Coast Salish territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. Um, we're also in the Port Moody Art Center, which is, uh, from what I understand, uh, the old um, town hall of Port Moody, and was jail, a courthouse, um, I believe like a kindergarten school location for a little bit. So um, I think given, given the context of this work that I'm going to be talking about tonight, um, it's just important to recognize where we are. I, I think always important to recognize where we are as we kind of walk around. It's going to be pretty freeform. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the inspiration behind the work. Um, a little bit about the process, uh, maybe some of my interpretations of the work, but I, um, uh, yeah, I guess I'm, it's by no means like, uh, just a guide for how to understand the work, but uh, that would obviously be up to uh, anyone who entered the space. Um, before I begin, I'd like to say some thanks to folks, so Janice and the Port Media Art Center for allowing to happen for the support. Um, Caitlin, who's behind the camera today, and simply following me around. Um, the work wouldn't have been possible without uh, Jack and Adam of Unbuilders, um, a really great initiative in Vancouver to dismantle old homes by hand and salvage as much wood as they can um, to lower the, the waste of, of demolition in the city. Um, and then uh, Peter Braun of New Leaf Editions, um, who uh, was incredibly helpful with letting me use space to print these works at this scale um, and just provide his printmaking expertise. Um, and then the Canada Council for the Arts for uh, funding a lot of the work. Um, maybe a little bit about myself. I, I grew up in, um, in East Vancouver in the community of Cedar Cottage, um, and I kind of, at the end of high school, started 
printmaking was introduced to it by my mom. Um, and then when I went to university, I ended up uh, really kind of falling in love with, with printmaking um, and relief printing in particular. And so for those that are unaware of what relief printing is, um, it's one of the oldest or the oldest form of making a multiple of an image. Um, and it involves uh, inking up a surface um, and then through the application of pressure, transferring the ink onto another material. So it's usually fabric or paper. Um, so in essence, they're kind of like a stamp. You can think of a stamp. Um, and so I, what I find very, very exciting about it is I, uh, the potential to use found materials um, in that process. So suddenly if you, if you find a piece of wood, um, you ink it up, and you apply pressure, transfer it onto paper or fabric, uh, you're capturing all the, all the textures that are in that wood, all the grains, maybe the history of use that's in that wood, uh, to how it's cut down, uh, how it was walked upon. Um, so, so I kind of have experimented with that for, for quite a long time. Um, and then upon returning to Vancouver after about seven years of not being in the city, um, being away working and studying, um, I uh, was really confronted by like, how much the city had changed in the last kind of decade. And I was aware because I would visit family that uh, to really be living in the neighborhood that I've grown up in, um, uh, I really had to confront um, a feeling of like really kind of feeling disturbed by the, the rate of, of change that had happened and was happening, um, and the displacement that was happening, how the culture of the city was changing. Um, and then also had to kind of come to terms with the real nostalgia that I felt for the community that I had grown up in. Um, now I'm also I'm kind of I'm skeptical of that nostalgia as well. Like I think uh, built environments inherently change. It's inevitable. I think it's uh, probably unwise and probably unhealthy to really cling to a narrative or a notion of what a place was. Um, there's always going to be a distortion with those kind of narratives. I think um, so. So this work here is at once kind of me working through that nostalgia, um, trying to kind of come to terms with what it means that these, uh, the kind of the landscape, the environment of, uh, of, of these neighborhoods in Vancouver are changing very rapidly. Um, but then also, you know, amidst the like rapid change, speed with which we can now change a, a space and an environment, um, feeling, feeling the importance of just like taking like a slow, attentive moment with the surfaces that are disappearing. Um, and so that, that really became the kind of driving uh, reason for making this work was Relief printing takes a long time. At the scale, it takes a long time. I started carving into the boards that I was getting, salvaged boards from um, that were taken from demolished homes in Vancouver. Um, sometimes, in the case of this, these boards were old growth flooring, uh, old growth that was fur flooring um, from actually a home uh, that was demolished just down the street from where I'm living. Uh, in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood. Um, yeah, so there, there's that. And some of the other pieces in the show involve more carving. This one involved cutting out the center, the center board, and kind of the print then becomes the frame um, of the pattern. It's the foliage pattern that's on the sheet. Um, but in other cases, the, um, the work or the carving becomes kind of a record of engagement. Um, with the surface. Um, yeah, so the, the process with which um, I kind of approached this work 
Uh, quite a long time, the a beginning point for me in my practice has been just walking around um, and observing and kind of um, collecting things, um, collecting materials um, that sometimes I know exactly why I find them intriguing, sometimes I can't quite put that into words right away. Um, and then kind of playing with them, fitting them together, carving into them. Um, usually they're interested in printing them. Um, uh, and then, you know, putting them through that process of turning them into a print, capturing the, uh, the textures of, um, of their surface, their, their patterns, these patterns start to show up. Um, I find that process very, very exciting. And there's a finality to, to a print that I really appreciate. So once they're printed, the works feel quite finished to me um, in a way that can be much harder to achieve in something like a painting or, um, or a drawing. Um, yeah, so I, I walk around. Um, in the case of these, I, I did a lot of cold calling to um, kind of construction companies and people that were taking down the houses. Um, I mean, there was this sense of, you know, someone who's interested in using found materials. Um, you know, the what, what were readable material kind of was there in my neighborhood than the, um, the kind of refuse of, of these homes that were coming down. And it really felt like and continues to feel like um, you know, on every block there's a couple of homes. Just a matter of talking someone into letting me actually access the wood, and that's where it was really great to make a relationship with unbuilders who were kind of um, in a different side of it, but a similar like, interest in trying to like, salvage as much as they could. Um, you know, a lot of this wood, like I mentioned, this old growth wood, we don't really act, we can't really access that again. Um, so, um, yeah, just an interest in kind of in collecting these materials. Um, and then uh, and then I started to kind of fit them together. I started to fit um, uh, one before I get into that, I mean there's a the wood is is really gorgeous. I mean it's a real like, pleasure to work with these surfaces. Um, you know, there was also, like, especially these older homes, these older structures, they are, um, you know, they're, they're built to last, I would say, in a way that is often aren't, something, you know, that has to be transitioned to something like Vancouver Specials and things like that, um, uh, not using materials that are as durable, um, uh, and quite, Literally, with some of these homes, that there is enough wood in a demolished home to build a new home. It will take the time to denail everything and take it apart by hand. Um, but that's that's really not how that's not how demolition and redevelopment is in the city right now. Um, so the the wood is worn. Um, you know, it's worn from from living its own life as like a old growth tree for hundreds and hundreds of years, but then also, so there's that kind of lived history that's in its grain, and then there's the history of its use after we harvested it. And so um, some of these were, you know, walked upon for a century. Um, um, and so, like I've mentioned, there was a real like interest in just spending an extended period of time with the surface. Um, so the, um, maybe I'll start with this piece. I mean, the entire the show is called Open House Press. Um, this piece is called Open House One. Um, and it is, it's the boards inked up um, uh, and printed onto uh, a thrifted uh, bed sheet, queen size bed sheet. Um, um, all the prints in the show are printed onto used bed sheets, um, and so that 
they each bring me like they're at, they have a different level of warmness. So uh, this one was quite uh, easy in some ways to work with. Um, there's another print that you'll see later on that uh, was very warm. It's a very old sheet, and so you know trying not to tear it and things like that. Um, but I like that even the substance that I was printing the material on has its kind of history of use as well, um, and its place within the, within the home. Um, so in this case, you know, there's an interest in working with a pattern, so you have a floral pattern, um, uh, referencing, you know, maybe something outside of the architectural spaces that we inhabit. Um, I was drawn to the density of, of the foliage pattern. Um, and then I had the idea of just cutting out the center square. And that um, started to kind of, for me, reference um, reference a window um, or reference uh, a canvas that's framed, the painting. Um, I like that the what is actually the print is framing the material. Um, so it, it kind of functions on my work. I like that the idea of framing also references these architectural spaces. Um, and so there's kind of this peering through at this, at this flat pattern. Um, now on the floor in front um, are the boards that were cut um, uh, and were not printed on this. They're this color because they're the same boards that we used for another print that you'll see later on, Open for Twilight. Um, but, uh, but I used the back side to print this print, Open House. Um, and I like that this is, it's at once a reference to where these, print, these, where these impressions come from. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, at least for myself, kind of references maybe light coming through a window, a spot of light on the ground, um, which will, I think will make more sense when you see the Vancouver twilight that is, um, has the gradient of the setting sun. It's very much referencing the end of the day, but also light. Um, and so that, that kind of ties into something that was important when I was thinking about putting the show together in this space, um, that, you know, while there are individual prints in the show, um, I really did want them all to be functioning kind of in an integrated way. Um, so the distinctions between one print from another, um, for me at least, start to break down formal similarities or these like, repetitions um, that start to really tie it together. And I, um, I was really keen to keep that going. And so as we walk around the, the square or the kind of this motif of the window kind of repeats um, and the squares line up. So you have a square here, a square on the ground, and then there's a square that's back to back over there. Um, uh, and that was that was very important, but then also the colors of the boards start to tie in with one another. The sheet sizes are the same. Um, they're all lined up. Um, it was a real pleasure to work in a space with such light windows, um, given all of this. Um, so after I've carved, after I've carved the uh, the boards or the, whatever I want to do with them ink is rolled onto the boards, um, they're laid down on the ground in the sequence that I want them to be in, um, and then a sheet is, is, so in this case, this sheet is, is laid flat over top of the ink boards, and then um, using a wooden spoon, I rub the back of it um, <laughs> quite a long time uh, and get, get that impression. Due to the scale, I just did not difficult to access a press that would be able to print these. Um, but once again, I kind of, I like that, like 
only at that point, almost like an absurd level of engagement with this surface and time spent, um, which felt quite important to the, to the work. Um, so the, so when you walk in, you see that piece and then, as I said, the square kind of repeats um, with, with its kind of hatched, hatched square. That was me with a router cutting into what was siding of a home in Vancouver. Um, uh, I'm really drawn, you know, you can see the, the nail marks in the wood, uh, you can see the wood grain. Um, because of the different material of being worn, I, um, they printed quite different. It might be difficult to see over the video, but if you do come to the space, the, uh, you'll see how they, um, I really had to embrace the way that the material would take it in. So some, some of them had more stretch in them, some were softer. Um, so this one was quite soft and quite worn, and so it's a little softer image as opposed to the one that you were seeing earlier. Um, so using a router, I, I cut um, for quite a long time just hatch marks. Um, and so like I mentioned before, it's kind of like a rec record of engagement with the surface. Um, but also um, maybe a canvas uh, framed by the wood once again, or maybe a blinded window. Um, so this hangs in space, and then on the other side, I did, and as we move to the other side, you see the same siding registered um, in the same way, but I, after printing this one, I recarved into it again and printed it again. And so, um, so maybe we'll, we'll just go around to the other side. Um, and so I, so I then reapproached the, the boards, um, carved in the arrows, all kind of culminating in the bottom right corner. Um, the, uh, I like the way that the Way that the boards are registered, it almost they kind of start kind of as a square and almost kind of cascade down. Um, and at the culmination of the arrows, uh, I I collected all the sawdust that was created through the carving of the boards, and they sit in mason jars um, at the bottom of the print. Um, yeah, it was quite. I was quite intrigued by the possibility of hanging them back to back in the space. It was very important that the work, given what the work is about, but I think just in general when presenting work, it's um, very important to give the work some space to breathe. Um, so I'm, I'm quite happy with the way people and visitors to the gallery can walk through these, that they, the prints themselves, start to kind of dictate walls or start to like frame the way someone through the space. Um, um, a lot of these are also like a play with color. Um, you know, that it's just like a real pleasure to, to have things kind of mimic one another, um, to play with how one color of ink sits upon another color of fabric. Um, um, so as you saw in this case, you have the same print, but it, the colors have switched. So you start with yellow ink on red, now we're red ink on yellow. Um, I find that, that play quite enjoyable. Um, the, um, this was the safe I had mentioned. So they came in a space that wasn't actually made to be a gallery. Um, it's got its kind of quirks that you have to work around. Uh, and so this is the final piece. In so the piece you just saw is called Open House 2, very much kind of functioning in reference to the first piece that you saw. Uh, and this one's called Vancouver Twilight. Um, it is on the oldest sheet in the show, so it was quite 
I really loved the way it printed. Um, there was something about how warm the sheet was and the kind of stretch that was in the sheet that um, gave a very nice impression, uh, but quite tricky because it tore quite easily as these little tear marks. And, um, and this really came from just kind of walking home right one day and just seeing uh, the sunset in Vancouver. Um, and then thinking, you know, those twilight being a period of transition, um, the city for me being in a real moment of transition. Um, so I decided to have kind of a, a sunset gradient um, or a dusk gradient. Um, I was in here with my mother the other day, and uh, she was saying that these resemble whales to her. Um, and so now when I look at it, I just see whales stacked upon each other. Um, but I, but I, I think that kind of speaks to um, the, uh, the possibilities of, of this kind of texture. You know, there's, there's all these uh, hidden little gems, I think. Um, or, or marks, um, both from just the wood itself, its use, the way it's carved, so you have these where piping was put through in the house, um, you have where bugs have eaten away at the wood, you have just the grain and knots, um, and then you also have uh, uh, moments where you can see the hammer marks of how it was removed, um, from the house, um, you can see where the old nail holes were, um, and then you can also see just marks that I've made in printing it. Um, uh, so you know, I, I had to wear knee pads while I printed it. And so there's moments where you can actually see the spiral pattern from the knee pads. Um, um, so once again, I mean, I, I think that the the real kind of work. I think it's functions somewhere between the process of making it and its presentation. Like I don't. Um, this is and is not the work in some ways. Um, this is kind of a record of, of engagement. Um, the uh, yeah, the period where this was maybe not going to be in the show, and I'm quite happy that it is. Um, it's presented in front of, and this was just one of the funny things about working in the space, it's presented in front of or hung in front of two more windows. Um, and so we're a cloudy, rainy day right now. It works well for this event um, um, because it's not being backlit, so we can see the textures and the colors really well. But on a, on a sunny day, this is West facing. On a sunny day, as the day comes to an end, I kind of like the irony of the fact that as the sun sets, the light coming from that actually obscures the print itself. Um, as you can see, two rectangles will appear um, and kind of blow out um, uh, the ink. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of liked that, that, that subtle play. Yeah, I'm sure I'll think of other things to say, but I, um, I think I think for now that that's kind of all that comes to mind. I know that Janice was maybe gonna have questions. Do you want to mention questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's there's an opportunity <laughs> that if people want to uh, comment, a question or two that comes to mind, I'm happy to answer them. Um, uh, I will say that you can come, um, if you happen to be passing through Fort Moody, um, you, can, you can come in. Um, uh, obviously, it's an awkward time uh, to be having events, and so that's why we're doing this digitally. But the, I, I really think that um, you know, material work should be seen in person. Um, Due to its scale, I think it's quite important to, and due to 
is quite textured. Um, uh, I think it is quite, it is a lot more fulfilling to see the work in person. Um, so if you do happen to come by, my understanding is that the gallery will be open Tuesday to Friday, um, 11 to 5, I believe. Um, and there will be, a, uh, the rest of the art, the art center is actually closed. Um, so there might be a closed sign on the door, but there will also be a phone number for Janice who opened this talk, um, who will, you can phone, she's a gallery manager, she would come and let you in. Um, uh, there is also an online kind of digital gallery with, with kind of more close-ups of the work and um, uh, a walkthrough video. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's move back here okay. and I'll do a pan around. <laughs> Yeah, I see the, I think there's a lot of possibility for this way of working, and I, um, I kind of see this as like an ongoing project. Um, and it, yeah, I think there's a lot more that could be done. And? <laughs> Hi, Sylvia. Um, I actually don't have questions, but there's uh, some comments. I think you, you should probably have a look tomorrow, but uh, Carolyn Green, Green? Green. Green? Oh, okay. Uh, it says Green's from Colorado. Oh, right. So <laughs> it's, it's actually G R I E. Right, of course. Yeah, it's actually yes. Very friendly. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Tioni, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce her last name, says she loves the textural look and colors. Well done. Oh, thanks, Tammy. So, yeah, so you can um, later go and comment on those. Um, I actually have a question. Okay. Um, are these the largest pieces you've done, and do you plan on doing any ones that are larger scale than this? <laughs> I, have, I have worked larger than this, um, I, but not often. I mean, this is definitely getting up there. I, in university, I kind of my first ever attempt at printing art structure, I printed the insides and outsides of a whole hay barn, and so those were kind of this height, but more like 20 feet long. Um, um, yeah, but I, I mean, I'm really drawn to scale, I mean, I, um, I think it's just very exciting to work large, um, but also, uh, I kind of like that things start to kind of resemble theatrical sets at a certain scale, um, mm -hmm. which I, I, I'm very drawn to. Um, yeah, so there's a second part to that question. I think that was yeah. it. Okay. Um, yeah. But I do have a question that just came in from Nellie Bell, sure. and she would like to know what happens to the wood now? Is this the end of its life? Right. Um, yeah, I think it. You know, this is just one more step in, thanks for the question, Nelly. One, one more step in its, in its life, I think. I mean, for now, it's sitting, a lot of it's sitting in my wood shop um, at my house. Um, I mean, some of it kind of stays and is, uh, you know, I can figure out ways of playing with it. Um, it could become kind of sculptural elements. Um, some of it will be discarded. Satisfying, I find uh, they're very satisfying surfaces, and so I think I will try to find ways of maybe integrating it into um, into other sculptures and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Using sections of them, I mean, I really try to like maximize the wood, and so the you know this print in Vancouver Twilight were printed using the opposite sides of the wood. Um, one, so one was more worn by footsteps than the other side did. So bottom side the wind have walked on and that was a bit of a rougher surface um, so really kind of thinking about ways of maximizing surface I mean um, if I decided that I didn't want to uh, install this little square again you know there'd be potential to make a small print like a square um, 
So I kind of I like just like having the resources kind of readily available. Um, but then you know at a certain scale, I mean my roommates, um, you know would uh, you know would, would get fed up if I just kind of kept every material that I worked with. And so um, some of it might you know um, I mean the initial idea for this pork was actually to print the make the prints in in the houses before they were demolished. I'd still love to play with that. Mm. Um, um, and in that case, you know, I would carve the floors, ink them, and then the, um, then it would all just be, it would just be demolished. Um, and that would, that would just be, that would be a part of it. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, I kind of see it as just like one more kind of step in its, in what has happened to this material. Mm -hmm. And I've got another question that came in from Dan, who would like to know, what do you think of the idea of the unique print versus the multiple or repetitive print? Sure. Um, the, yeah, I mean, you know, traditionally printmaking has been, has been a way of, of creating multiples. That's why, that's why we've developed different techniques and different processes for making, um, for making prints, so woodcuts, you know, you can create patterns with them, and then uh, you can do illustrations. We have you know, lithography that was established to print, I believe, sheet music, etchings, all of that kind of stuff, um, typography, and now laser printing. Um, and so, I, I guess in at a certain time, I think it would have it was amazing to have like a perfect edition. You know, if you're making etchings, it's like quite an achievement to um, to make you know an edition of a hundred etchings, and they they all look or close to identical. Um, I think in a time where um, if that's that's actually not that interesting for me anymore. You know, the the, the creation of a multiple. In some ways, um, uh, doesn't really captivate my imagination um, because it is—it's quite readable. You know, if I if I wanted if I want to make an exact multiple, uh, I can scan something and digitally print it in like high quality. Um, and so my approach to printmaking has kind of become more painterly, um, uh, in the sense that these are these are one-offs, um, and they are. They're not attempting to be kind of perfect in the way you would traditionally approach a print. They're much more about the process of, of making them, um, and that that is revealed in the final print itself. Um, yeah, I, I also like. I, I think I'm just, and I mentioned this at the beginning, but I'm drawn to the the finality of a print. Um, uh, often, when I'm not working with such a kind of like conceptual show, and it is just more of my own imagery. Um, they often start as kind of loose drawings, and there's something about turning it into a woodcut that, uh, and kind of letting that process change your image is kind of maybe it's a loose drawing. And then there's kind of almost like a rigidity to, to the process of like woodcuts is quite rigid. You know, you're, you're working with this hard surface, you're carving into it. Um, uh, I like the kind of that something's out of your control a little bit, um, and I find that very exciting. And so then you run something through the press, or I uh, apply pressure on these, and then this big reveal is the moment where I kind of pull the fabric off, um, and that's very exciting because I don't I don't actually know what's going to be there. I don't know how well it's transferred. I might have, you know over the years I've become better at kind of. Being able to read the surface a little bit better, but I, you know, I, I don't really know if I've put on the exact right amount of ink, if I've applied enough pressure, um, especially working with different fabrics. You know, they're all taking the ink differently. Inks themselves are different. So, like in this one, I use mainly an ultramarine ink. It's going to get very technical, but it uh, it dried a lot quicker than like the yellows and the reds and other inks that I was using, and so. This one, I actually had to um, apply pressure twice. I, I went over it twice, and it was like, it was really a bit of a nightmare to print. <laughs> this was 
significantly harder than the other ones. And I was very thankful that I cut out the middle so it was less surface area. But then if you were to go close to this, you can actually see very subtle, like almost gestural marks from where I where I've applied um, where I've applied the pressure. Um, yeah, thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm. And one last one from Tyler, who would like to know, is there a relationship between pattern and the weather or wear in your work? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> the, the, so the question again is, can you repeat the question? Yeah, is there a relationship between pattern and the weather or wear in your work? Okay, yeah. Um, Yes, um, I mean, I, I see, um, for, for me, just like image making is a kind of like piecing together that often at a certain scale starts to become a pattern. And so, um, like I was mentioning, like as you walk into the gallery, you start to like, my hope is that the viewer starts to or the visitor starts to see connections between different things. And through seeing those similarities, seeing those, um, uh, I guess those connections, um, we start to kind of create meaning. I think we kind of create meaning through seeing patterns in a more abstract sense. Um, and so kind of, we kind of, we, through those processes, through those recognitions we can start to um, kind of make sense of our world and like create create meaning. Um, and so I um, you know I, I see um, I see a very like, formal pattern. I was thinking I mean it once was like it was quite deliberate in the making of this show, but it also kind of came about in its own way. I mean I think uh, the beautiful thing about uh, and what makes me so fascinated by pattern is that you, it's there regardless of whether you want it to be or not. You could, you're always going to be able to find a connection between things. Um, and so, um, you know, there's a pattern in where, where the wood came from. There's a pattern in like what's going on in Vancouver right now, what's going on in our built environments. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that totally answers the question, but I, um, I think, at least for myself, you know, the recognition of pattern is pretty central to like my understanding of place. Um, yeah, thanks, yeah. That's it. Well, I wanted to ask a question. Sure. And you had mentioned that you're continuing to work on these pieces to to right. enlarge this body of work, and. Are you planning to um, increase the size of the exhibition and, and apply in other galleries that you could show the work? Sure, yeah. I mean, I have, um, I have a show coming up this winter at Snap Gallery in Edmonton, which is the uh, Society of Northern Alberta Printmakers. With this? And some of this will potentially be in that show, okay. um, depending on you know, what I create this fall. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, this was a small, I mean, uh, because of everything that was happening in the world and having to work to support myself, I, this was kind of a small iteration of what, um, where I actually saw this work coming. I mean, initially, you know, before COVID happened and everything, I saw this as being a much more collaborative process. So it was going to be working with local writers um, or just inhabitants. Um, and coming up with text that would then I would carve into um, carve into these surfaces um, and they would be printed. And so in that case, I would take the role of maybe the artist and the role of like just the printmaker, um, almost like a technician, um, which I, I would still be interested in doing. Um, I think that could be a really interesting, interesting body of work. Um, uh, but I, you know, I've played around with casting shadows onto these boards and then carving the shadows out. Um, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of possibility. I mean I um, 
yeah, I mean, it, and then I would love to eventually actually print uh, a structure as it's still standing. So currently these boards have been taken and denailed, um, which makes so many elements of it a lot easier. Um, but it would be it would be very exciting that you work in on site um, and have that kind of effect with what is either the print turns out as or like what is maybe carved or not carved um, into, into the surface. Um, and then there's something for me that I think you know if a surface is going to be um, going to be demolished anyway, um, something I find. Quite intriguing about spending all that time to carve carve that surface and then it is demolished anyway. Um, that it, it is really this final impression of these structures. Um, and so that's the coming back to the question that was asked earlier, is that there's that funny thing with printmaking where often the matrix or the blocks with which you take the impression are just as satisfying as the prints themselves. Um, but I, can't, I often like that they're not presented. I like that there's like, there's this absence, there's almost this ghosting happening, there's this present, like you, you take an impression of something, the thing itself isn't in the room. Um, obviously in this case, I, I have some of the boards, but I see them, but they're, they're actually the boards that are absent from the print itself. Um, uh, but I, I, like, I like that absence. I find that, um, or the fact that maybe the boards do disappear, that are maybe they are demolished or burned um, in the way that they would have been if I hadn't ever engaged, and that all that remains is something like a print. Well, I think that if the, if a larger version of Open House Press becomes a touring exhibition, you'll have to keep us informed so that we can. Uh, Go and visit and yeah. things. It's, mm -hmm. it's only fitting that um, you paid homage to heritage homes and that the first showing of Open House Press is in a heritage building. Yeah. So it's, uh, I, I'm sure a lot of the homes that you were, that were, uh, you resourced your materials from were in uh, similar eras to what the Port Moody Art, when the Port Moody Art Center was built. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think, um, and part of that is just the necessity of, you know, you, you, you do, you're not going to have a company like Land Builders go into a Vancouver special and salvage that wood. Like, it's actually just not worth anything. They're able to make an economic claim that this wood is worth something because it's old growth. And, and so it is, it, is, it is a real pleasure to work with that kind of wood. But I'm not, um, I'm totally open to working with wood that isn't, doesn't have that kind of history as well. I think, it, I think they'd be quite different works. Um, but I, um, even using, you know, like plastic siding of, of homes and things like that, you know, as we, I think one of the things that I find difficult about the way cities are shifting is we are kind of going to like a smoothness of texture in cities. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like, it's kind of glass and steel. It's kind of, it's, there's like this newness that suddenly doesn't have that texture that I'm talking about, but even, you know, um, something that's not as well made, something that's not as well made, um, but has a surface that can Warm. Um, that's still quite a, an exciting source for me of material to use. Um, uh, yeah, and feel I mean, there's something for me that gives a little bit more uh, human engagement. Seems a little bit more readable. Seems a little bit more possible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, and then there's one last question from a Jay Hamburger, who I imagine you might know, <laughs> which is, <laughs> what other artists have inspired or influenced you with such a unique approach to this art form that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, it, 
I mean, the list goes on. I mean, I'm surely, I'm definitely, I mean, I'm not the first person to deal with structures and, and uh, print, um, uh, print architecture. I'm not the first person to sort of work with architecture. Um, I know, like, many years ago, in my early interest in um, kind of expanding what could be printed and what relief printing could do, um, there's a German artist named Thomas Kilper who does print structures before they're demolished often, um, and he's printed like massive halls. He gets a lot of people to help him, um, and he, he often prints like very kind of these like illustrated histories of of these spaces. So he did, um, and they're quite political. They're quite politically charged, um, and then the prints are installed in the space or draped off the walls of, of the buildings. Uh, not less houses, more like old warehouses and things like that, or old halls. Um, so that, um, you know, I found that approach quite, quite intriguing. Uh, I really love the idea of having the work not function in the gallery, having to present presentation, function outside of the gallery, maybe on the side of the building. Um, um, you know, and then there's, you know, there's local artists, you know, there's a great local artist, Emily Newfield, who actually has a show opening at the Richmond Park Gallery um, next week um, uh, that people should go to, and she, she works with uh, homes and structures that are, once again, kind of falling into disrepair or ruin, um, and she's a sculptor, her background's kind of in carpentry and things like that, so she, she makes kind of interventions in the space, it's kind of like um, uh, a much kind of earlier iteration that was like Gordon Mann and Clark, um, doing like carved with massive holes in warehouses in New York City. Um, hers is quite different, but and then documentation of that and things like that, and then uh, different iterations of that would exist in the gallery. Um, yeah, I, I find like that when art is coming out of a context that's not just a studio. I find that very exciting. Um, but when it's coming out of like an engagement with a street or a, or a structure or a person um, that's kind of outside of the quotes of art world, um, that for me is more dynamic. It's easy to tell the things that you're passionate about. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, being here in the gallery. Uh, this is the first exhibition, this group of exhibitions are the first ones we've had in our gallery since we shut on March 16th. So um, it's a real pleasure to have your work here and have art on our walls again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for tuning in. Um, next week, we will have our second Hui M. Choi recipient, Gina Luke, with her exhibition. So I hope you'll join us on August 27th at 7.15. And thank you for watching the Art Sessions tonight. Good night. <laughs>